All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar, uh, Cracking uh, COVID-19, uh, and how you can use your, uh, how can you essentially help to adjust your AI startup to uh, maybe be able to be a little bit more adjusted to the current crisis. Uh, so while we're waiting for people to uh, connect on Zoom, uh, I would love for those that are here to maybe just say a quick hello and chat. Uh, feel free to uh, introduce yourself, maybe tell us a little bit about who you are. Uh, if you're a startup, if you are a scientist, uh, if you are a student, uh, you know, by all means, uh, say a quick uh, hello and uh, let us know who you are. Uh, for those uh, who have not met me before, my name is Sydney Swain Simon, and I was a founding member of District 3, and I'm the current AI fellow. Uh, so if you're not familiar with District 3, District 3 is an innovation hub based out of Concordia University in Montreal. Uh, so we support tech teams to create businesses to help achieve global impact, and uh, we do this through offering a variety of different services, uh, such as one-on-one -on -one coaching, meetings with different subject matter experts, uh, we also host a lot of workshops. Uh, we help them also do global expansion into other markets. And uh, also the, we provide uh, seed funding for those who qualify. Uh, we've been around for around seven years now and have worked with close to 550 startups. So my role specifically within District 3 is to help and support and create initiatives around artificial intelligence. Uh, and we have done this with uh, a variety of different partners uh, since the past five years or so. Uh, so we've worked with Singular University Canada, with the XPRIZE Foundation, with the AI for Good Summit, among many others. Uh, our most recent initiative that we did was the AI and Genomics Program, which we ran from January until April, uh, which allowed life scientists to get an opportunity to get some training around advanced forms of machine learning and how to apply them to, uh, how to apply it to genomics data. Uh, this is a program that we did with a few partners here in Montreal, including Mila, the City of Montreal, Genome Quebec, Montreal and Vivo, and uh, Ivado, of course. So, why are we here today? Well, the subject of COVID-19 and AI is not a novel one at this point. Uh, you know, there's been a variety of different conferences and uh, webinars that have been done around this subject. Uh, for example, about a month ago, or a month after closure started to happen in March, uh, the Stanford Institute of uh, Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence uh, did a virtual conference around the subject, and they had a variety of speakers, uh, people like Fei-Fei Li, who presented how AI could be used to help elderly care, specifically those with uh, acute infections or chronic disease. You had uh, Bin Ben Shen, who is a PhD student at Stanford, who was using ML to identify vaccine candidates. Um, and you had other people as well, you know, doing a variety of other things. Um, you know, outside of conferences, there's also just been a huge amount of research being done um, and there's been a huge amount of funding that's also been released to help and support AI research and the startup community. Uh, to kind of give you a, uh, an example, you know, on GitHub, uh, you know, there's a user by the name of uh, Holobit, H-O-L-L-O-B-I-T, who was able to identify around 900 initi initiatives or so, um, you know, that are happening across the world. So, you know, there's been quite a lot that has happened. Um, However, the conversation around AI startups and COVID-19 is perhaps something that hasn't been as discussed as much, uh, especially those maybe that are uh, struggling to adapt to the current uh, situation. Uh, we do know that startups are being impacted by COVID-19. Uh, according to BDC, 90% of Canadian entrepreneurs feel a negative impact from COVID-19. Uh, I think those are specifically those on the East Coast. Uh, with 62% of uh, companies uh, uh, that they surveyed noticed a lack of, inf of demand for their service. Um, you know, it's something that's been identified at the federal level as well here in Canada. Uh, there is a relief fund that was put in place for $250 million for early stage technology companies. Um, so there's definitely uh, a lot of companies who are struggling right now. Um, you know, and it's not just, uh, you know, companies in, in Canada that are struggling. Uh, according to an article that was written on PitchBook, and for those who are not familiar with PitchBook, it's a company that aggregates a lot of the startup data and who's getting funding. Um, according to a survey that was done, uh, around uh, 60 VC-backed companies, uh, of uh, 60 uh, VC-backed companies, 25% of the businesses reported having to lay off employees. Uh, even in the UK, uh, investment groups, private equity groups are suffering over there. Uh, as an example, 3i Group. Uh, uh, which is based out of London, had 32 companies in its profile who saw a 70% fall in gross returns. So, 
uh, beyond the drops in demand, you can know, you, uh, you know, there's big changes that are happening in the world of private equity, which is also impacting startups. Um, you know, in the U.S. as an example, uh, there is at least half a dozen cases of uh, private equity deals that were canceled once COVID-19 started to occur and emerge as a pandemic. Um, and that was numbers a little bit old, so it's probably much higher now. So, um, but however, there doesn't seem to really be a consistent pattern in terms of how it's impacting different startups. And even in AI, uh, AI companies, each one is struggling or some are, are doing relatively well considering the current uh, crisis. Um, if you're just looking at the uh, self-driving uh, vehicle sector, uh, you had uh, Cruise, which was a self-driving unit of General Motors. They laid off around 160 workers, um, but Wave, uh, uh, which was able to raise essentially $750 million to help drive their self-driving uh, vehicle initiatives, among other things. Um, people are even speculating that HR tools uh, a or AI tools are going to become in high demand uh, once the pandemic is over. And if you look at HR AI tools as an example, uh, people are estimating that they will become uh, incredibly in high demand simply because there's gonna be a large amount of workforce that is gonna be applying to, to a lot of jobs. And it, you know, if you have a small HR team, you're not necessarily gonna have the capability to go through all the candidates uh, uh, properly. So what should AI startups be doing as a response to this pandemic? This is what we will explore today. Um, so let me introduce our speakers. Our first speaker today will be Patricia Groover. Uh, Patricia is the research and innovation attache at the Quebec government office in Boston, where she facilitates research and technology partnerships between Quebec and the United States. Uh, she also serves as the co-chair of the Science and Technology Diplomatic Circle in Boston, an organization of 67 countries with international offices in the Boston region. Patricia received a bachelor's in biology from uh, Eurocinus uh, College in Pennsylvania. Uh, and a master's in public health from the University of Sydney in Australia. Uh, before working for Quebec, she worked for the UK Science and Innovation Network for three years, where she led the oceans and communications effort for the entire US team. In this conference, in this role rather, she represented the UK at the UN uh, Oceans Conference in 2017 and received an award for her uh, communications work. In June 2018, Patricia was a member of the 2018 cohort for the AAAS Science Diplomacy and Leadership Workshop in DC. Uh, welcome, Patricia. Our next speaker today is uh, Patricia, uh, not Patricia, Jean-François Connolly, uh, with an interest in uh, all aspects of machine learning from algorithm development to product marketing. Uh, Jean-François has gained over 14 years of experience through his studies. Uh, he did a master's in applied mathematics and a PhD in uh, face recognition. Uh, and he has a work experience as well in their domain of natural language processing and ad tech. Uh, he currently oversees the entrepreneurship initiatives at the Ivado. Uh, prior to joining Ivado, JF worked at the Data Critic, which was one of the Montreal's first startups doing machine learning and advertising, as well as at Nuance. He also advises companies at Creative Destruction Labs in Montreal. Our final speaker today is Po Shen Lo. Po is a social entrepreneur working across the full spectrum of mathematics and education all around the world. He's a math professor at Carnegie Mellon University and the founder of free personalized learning uh, of the free personalized learning platform xp.com. That's expii.com, uh, a social enterprise supported by a series of online math courses that reinvents uh, the middle school math curriculum with a focus on creative thinking. Uh, he is also the national coach for the USA International Mathematical Olympiad team, and under his coaching, the team won the competition in 2015, 2016, 2018, 2019, uh, with a win in 2015 being the first one for the US since 1994, I believe. Uh, during the COVID-19 outbreak, he turned his mathematical attention to developing Novid, the first anonymous contact tracing app released in the US. Uh, for both Android and iOS, which collects no personal information, and I believe you'll be talking a little bit more about that today. So with that, Prashesha, I'll ask for you to uh, unmute yourself and uh, say a quick hello. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh, what's going on with you? Yep, thank you for the introduction, Sydney. So um, as Sydney mentioned, um, I have a public health background, um, so I feel like that's been uh, very you know, having that experience, um, I worked for the Harvard School of Public Health and the University of New South Wales um, Public Health Department as well. So having that experience um, while also working for government and also, um, you know, 
helping startups and research institutions in the AI space has been very interesting, especially right now with COVID-19, because there's definitely um, a lot of overlap between uh, the public health sector right now and artificial intelligence. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening here in Boston, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, some of the initiatives that are coming out of some of the work that we're doing at the Quebec government office in Boston. Um, so, you know, Boston is in the same situation as many of these other, um, you know, technology uh, based cities. But I would say that we do have an advantage in that we are the life sciences hub of the world at the moment, um, I would argue. So um, that's, you know, been maintaining a lot of the job and workforce here in the Boston area. There have been, um, you know, several layoffs, for example, um, a, com a large company known as like Easy Cater let off, I think like 25 to 50% of their employees, um, but they are hoping to hire them back as soon as uh, the pandemic is over and people are allowed to go back to the office at some point. Um, there's also been some surprising studies. Um, the Mass Technology Leadership Council about a month ago did a survey of the 30 top um, tech uh, CEOs or executives here in the Boston region, and they found that one third of them are still currently hiring. Um, so there is, um, you know, even though there are some layoffs in Boston, there's still a lot of hiring going on, which is great to see. And, um, you know, like I said before, we have the life sciences industry, which is really um, holding its own in terms of what's going on in, in COVID-19 uh, research and development. Um, as I'm sure most of you are aware, Moderna um, is the leading American um, vaccine research and development uh, for COVID-19. Uh, they just finished their phase one trials um, and they announced their data this past week. Um, they didn't publish their data, but they, the company came out with a statement about how they saw the same um, results as somebody who had previously been infected with COVID-19 two weeks after getting the injection for, um, that they had developed. So that's uh, you know, good preliminary news. So um, you know, we'll see what happens with uh, Moderna and a lot, like I said, a lot of other research institutions um, in the Boston area are heavily involved in COVID-19 research. My former employee, the Harvard School of Public Health, is obviously doing a lot. Um, they're kind of leading the way in, um, in the epidemiology field here in the U.S. right now. Um, and also there's, you know, a lot of clinical research going on at the hospitals, like Mass General Hospital, Boston Children's, is doing a lot of work on the Kawasaki um, disease, which is related to the coronavirus as well. Uh, so with all that in mind, you know, it's not all doom and gloom here. Um, I think that eventually as things start um, getting a bit back to normal, although not, you know, back to where it was before, um, we'll see an uptick in um, hiring again. And hopefully some of the people that had been laid off in the tech industry can be um, rehired. Although I'm sure it will be, you know, a very um, long process to get back to where we were uh, pre-pandemic. So I just wanted to talk really quickly about um, some of the work that we've been doing uh, with the Quebec government office um, on AI and uh, um, COVID-19. So for the past two and a half years, um, the Quebec government office has in Boston has been working on um, something called the AI Triangle, which is a tri-city regional collaborative between the cities of Boston, Montreal, and Pittsburgh which is all represented on this um, panel. So that's great. We're already doing something for the um, AI triangle. Um, and we have um, facilitated meetings uh, between the three cities and its key stakeholders in artificial intelligence over the past two and a half years. Um, with a, We basically have uh, three pillars to the AI triangle. One is ethics, inclusion, and diversity. One is um, workforce development and maintaining our workforce. And the third is supporting innovation slash, slash support startups. And now with um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we see the AI triangle as hopefully being, um, you know, this community that could be leveraged in order to uh, propel some of the research 
forward or even to just share best practices on what each of the three cities are doing um, on, um, you know, in, as it relates to AI and COVID-19. So some of the things that we've been thinking about um, are contact tracing, um, using artificial intelligence to find uh, vaccine targets, and also artificial intelligence for misinformation. So those are some of the three things that we're um, looking at as potential projects that the AI triangle could potentially tackle. Um, and so we're now in the process of meeting with stakeholders and trying to see, um, you know, what, what, where is the best place for us to actually make an impact. Um, and then from there, um, that will be the, the topic that we focus on. Um, so yeah, that's kind of all I had to say about the AI triangle for now and the AI stuff that we're up to. Well, thank you. Um, maybe uh, just a few questions before we go on to uh, Jean-Francois. And uh, for people that are listening in, uh, if you do have any questions for the panelists, you can use the Q&A button uh, just at the bottom of your uh, Zoom interface to ask them there. Um, either I'll ask the questions or the, um, the panelists will just uh, answer it directly. Um, but uh, Patricia, you know, one of the things that I was excited, that one of the reasons why I was excited to have you on board today uh, for this uh, panel is that you have this perspective from the government side and, you know, having, you know, a voice from the government can be very difficult at times, especially when we're talking about startups, you know, making that connection is not always a direct thing. Um, but before we get into maybe the startup angle, I had more a question around policy. So since your background is quite interesting, you know, you've had this opportunity to work with a variety of different government agencies uh, for different countries. Uh, you've got a unique glimpse on how each one manages and promotes innovation as how as well as help it helps to ensure that uh, policymakers are well informed on different subjects. Um, so from your perspective, do you believe that this pandemic is forcing the government to make science innovation a bigger priority? Or do you believe that maybe this policy change that are being put in place right now is a short term one? Or do you think this will have a long term impact? Well, I hope that it's a long-term impact. You know, I mean, we've seen from previous, um, you know, obviously not as um, disruptive, uh, but SARS in 2001, um, you know, that was a pretty big deal. And while we did ramp up our public health um, response immediately after, it might have kind of been forgotten about. And, um, you know, unfortunately, public health is not the first priority. Um, for, for every um, country, but I would say that hopefully this is making people think that, you know, these things need to be in place long term. I think the countries that we've seen have the best response to this pandemic are those people that have supported their public health systems for years and have been waiting and ready for the next pandemic. So, you know, Taiwan, South Korea, you know, they, they learned the lessons from SARS and MERS and they kept that, um, those, um, you know, the expertise and the science and innovation and the public health measures in place. So when the next pandemic came, they were ready. So hopefully that is a lesson that we that will learn from this. Um, and then in terms of you know, support. I think now government should realize how important basic science is. Um, you know, people might have questioned before, why are you studying uh, bat research in um, Indonesia? Uh, or why are we using like US federal funding for that? And now I think it's pretty obvious why we are, um, you know, focusing on, on basic science. So hopefully, um, in, my, in my hope, that that's something that will be, um, you know, definitely uh, pursued more. And I think also, you know, the molecular biology side of this, the immunology side of this, hopefully that will um, continue to be funded even once this um, pandemic is over, as you know, it becomes more and more apparent that we need um, to get in front of these before it gets, you know, too explosive like this one did. So like I said, that's my hope. Um, and, and I think, you know, most governments are probably learning that we do need to fund basic science and innovation um, in order to get in front of crises like this. 
So, uh, so for the startups that are listening right now, um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, having these conversations with government can be a little bit difficult, uh, and, and having a relationship with them. Um, so maybe just to start off with, uh, as a question, you know, in what ways do you think startups should aim to work with the government? You know, obviously a lot of companies, a lot of startups, especially in Canada, go, help go to the government to try and find funding, uh, whether it's programs that are in place or they sometimes try and find other uh, available funding that's there. Um, but obviously there's other ways that you can also work with the government. So what are your suggestions for AI startups to help guide maybe policies, for example, to increase innovation? Well, I think, you know, finding out who, um, you know, within the government, whether it's federal, provincial, or if you're in the U.S., looking at the state level and how, um, like, who is in charge of actually the policymaking and how can you make um, it apparent to them that this is either what needs to be funded or that this is, you know, some sort of problem. So just an example, um, in the city of Somerville here in uh, uh well, it's not Boston, but it's right outside of Boston. Um, you know, they, their um, council uh, people had, had decided that they were going to not allow facial recognition technology. And that was, um, I believe that was spurred on by some research that was done by the ACLU Massachusetts. And so, um, sorry, the ACLU is the American Civil Liberties Union for um, the Canadians. Um, but yeah, so, so those kinds of things, you know, finding out, um, even if it's just on a very small level, you know, Somerville is not a huge city. If anybody doesn't know where it is, it's right next to Cambridge um, in Massachusetts. But, you know, that can be a step forward in taking those discussions wider. So because of that happening in Somerville, I know that there are talks with other policymakers in other cities. Um, you know, about where facial recognition technology can go. Um, and, and so those kinds of things. Um, another thing that has been um, big here, especially in the Boston area, is allowing, um, you know, self-driving car, um, like a, a sandbox or like a testing space. So here in the seaport, um, there, there's actually part of the mayor's office is called um, it's like the city of Boston's new urban mechanics uh, laboratory. And so they are in charge of that test bed. So making sure that you, you know, know who within um, either the city, the state or the federal level, um, who you're trying to um, connect with and who's the decision maker um, and making sure that you're getting in front of them is always important. And, um, you know, associations, for example, can already have those relationships. So if you, um, I, I, I believe some of the work that was done to get a testing, um, you know, roadway in the seaport was done by Mass Robotics, for example, here in Boston. So having an association who already has those uh, policy connections can also be a good way to uh, make sure that you get uh, in front of the right people. Well, thank you, Patricia. Uh, I have definitely a lot more questions to ask, uh, ask you, but uh, we'll move on and come back to you later on. Um, so next, I'll uh, ask for uh, Jean-Francois to uh, say a quick hello. So Jean-Francois, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh, the work that's being done at Ivado. So, uh, well, hi, everybody. So uh, as you mentioned, Sydney, so uh, I have, I've been in the AI game for the last, well, 15, 16 years, so if you include the studies. And so me, I have first and foremost an engineering background. So I did a bachelor's degree in, in electrical engineering. And one of the class that I actually liked was uh, the dreaded uh, at Polytechnic uh, probability for engineers. And so I ended up doing a master's degree uh, with, with the professor giving the class. And this is when uh, I got into the game. And basically I was looking for a data scientist job in 2005 after the master's degree and it did not exist. So it was quite depressing for me. And the only people talking about data science or something similar were uh, like the business schools who were talking about uh, data mining and it was very basic level. So it was uh, people in marketing uh, talking about uh, 
uh, talking about data mining. And so, uh, so at the time, I mean, the, lucky, the logical choice, if you wanted a job in the field, was to do a PhD because the only people hiring were big research centers. And so this is what uh, I ended up doing. And then the job market opened up and, and so on and so on. And so I worked for a few years and then I ended up at Ivado in charge of everything related to entrepreneurship. So at Ivado, basically what it is, so it's uh, Institut de Valorisation des Données, or it's a, it's a French acronym that stands in English for uh, broadly the Data Valorization Institute. So uh, we, we do many things. So our overall goal is to drive research in everything related to data. So we don't want to tag ourselves as being an AI entity. It's really, anyway, when people say AI today, what they really mean is taking data and making something with data. So uh, you all, that includes business intelligence, yes, machine learning, uh, operations research, which we must not forget, and AI itself. So us, uh, the core, uh, there are two main pillars at Nivado. So it's really uh, the research where we give a lot of funding for uh, research without an industrial partner. So it's a classic master's degree, PhD, postdocs uh, grant. And so for, for that scientific program, for, for these scientific programs, so what we did for COVID-19, so we had a call for proposals. And so we, 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 we funded and also we helped people who were proposing uh, a project uh, put them into contact with professors and uh, postdocs and postdoc researchers and PhD students. So really, uh, we, we put that program like quickly. And so uh, the, the, the only, the, the submission process was, was send us like a two pager uh, document and we'll take a look at it and evaluate it and prioritize uh, internally. And so it was really quickly done. And so we financed a few projects on that. Uh, you can see them on our website. And so that's, one part of Ivado. So, and the other part of Ivado, which I'm part of, it's really, you can see us like a tech transfer uh, or a, a university bureau, where we uh, are a bridge between uh, the industry and academia, uh, always in the context of starting a research projects. So we are here to do research. And uh, so, at first, we were hit by the wave of uh, people doing machine learning. But and then again, I mentioned uh, earlier, so although there's a big hype around deep learning, machine learning for the last, well, that hype is kind of decreasing and now the real work is starting. And so let's not forget that operations re Montreal has been very well known for operations research in the last 40 years. And so this is what is interesting. So uh, Patricia mentioned a lot, uh, a lot of projects being done around healthcare, but uh, another nightmare that people are having these days is, is around supply chain. And so yes, with Ivado, uh, with research group like uh, the Gerard, uh, with the supercluster, with the scale AI, so supply chain and logistics uh, using AI, a supercluster in Montreal. So uh, not only in research, we're still maintaining our expertise, but now we're developing like a really good commercial branch around supply chain. So it's really a mix both uh, families of, uh, of techniques and so so in a nutshell that's Ivado so we do a lot of stuff so uh, training sessions and so on so we're still adapting ourselves and so we we are still kind of a little bit in, still in startup mode because we're we're quite young and uh, so me most of my work has been to collaborate with the rest of the ecosystem so all the entrepreneurship uh, all the uh, entrepreneurship initiative that has been done in Montreal so uh, was done under the leadership of mostly Bonjour Startup Montréal and also uh, the main, so Mouvement des Accélérateurs d'Innovation du Québec. And so, uh, so they, they kind of took the leadership and everybody's participating in that. So there were task force and, and uh, so a yeah, big shout out to, to these people. And so because they, there were several issues that we noticed. So at first people were in, uh, in the mode of kind of panicking saying, what should we do? And then they quickly figured that out. And so now they're more in the game of uh, how we do that. So we, we pivoted, uh, we're still pivoting, but now how we actually do uh, our new product and, and what are the constraints then? And so this is where I feel we can help. And this is where the efforts are going. So uh, startups want less program and they want more like one-on-one -on -one coaching or they want to be put in contact with big companies, not necessarily to sell product because of course it's the end game, but also to validate uh, their new ideas or, uh, or, or their pivot. So 
And this is where we feel that we can help because we have a large network. And, but I mean, this is, we're still figuring out that out ourselves. As you mentioned, you know, you've been around for, for a little while in the machine learning field here in Montreal. Um, and I think your startup experience goes back to, to 2014 with your work with uh, Data Critic. Um, so you've really kind of seen the emergence of the AI community here. And, and you know, there was a massive explosion of, of growth back in 2015 uh, when, you know, especially with Livado, that's when we kind of really kind of came into the public space uh, of what they were doing. Um, so you've seen the rise of this community and now you're seeing it experience an event that hasn't been seen since the, the Spanish flu. So overall, how do you think that the startup community is responding to this change? Do you think it's been very, a very quick, easy change, or do you think that there's still maybe a certain percentage of people that are starting? Well, my, by definition, uh, me, the, the term for, for that entire field, the term that I prefer is read data science, because at the core of it, there's data and it's really a science because there's a scientific process to it. So you, you have to define hypothesis and then validate that hypothesis with, uh, with data basically. And so it's really an iterative process. So at the core of it, I mean, people doing data science are already used to work with an iterative process. So they are very well positioned to, to be able to adapt quickly. That being said, uh, you need data. So you, you can get around to it. So if uh, so, for the retail industry, for instance, if you want to try to predict uh, how much uh, items, how much uh, that you need, uh, because you, you you want to plan your way, warehouse usage, and so on, well, you need to assume that the the, the historical data that you have, well, it's it's uh, going down the drain. So it's not useful anymore. So it's, it's these kinds of problem that people will need to address. And, and, and the way I saw that the field uh, evolve. So again, so my background is mostly electrical engineering uh, to start with. And so this is where you saw the first, uh, the, the first kind of ecosystem around machine learning. So back in the days, uh, so I'm talking like uh, the 90s and, and early 2000s, it was still called pattern recognition. And so at the core of it, uh, the, the first people doing AI uh, or machine learning or data science, uh, they were people who were building applications and they needed these techniques to actually build their application. Either that or like physicists who, were, who needed to do data science to analyze the data. And so what you see today is you still have that core group who are used to building stuff. And so they kind of have a little bit of domain expertise, but you have these general data scientists where the, the, the core of their training is really doing machine learning and AI. And, and, and so with these ones, you, are, you still have the tendency, they still have the tendency to say, okay, uh, like I'm doing, uh, I'm trained with using deep learning. So I see deep learning being applied everywhere. So it's like, uh, I have a hammer and I'm looking for nails everywhere. And, uh, so you have to be careful uh, with these people. So you, you, for, for, for the more generalist people, well, don't forget about domain expertise. I mean, it's still fundamental. So if you want to move in healthcare and do something about healthcare, well, I mean, have some domain expertise in healthcare. If you want to move in supply chain, well, I mean, you were trained doing machine learning. Uh, most supply chain problem are operations research. So it's a different game. So uh, have that knowledge inside your team. So. It's a, uh, and then again, I mean, Patricia, uh, another thing that Patricia mentioned is going back to basic science. Me for the startups, it's going back to the basic business models concept. So, I mean, don't forget the basic. It's just a business model is a business model. So it's uh, the technology is uh, unlike a few years ago, we have the open source library. So the technology entry barrier is very low. Uh, and things are working. So the, the, the training algorithms are working. Me, uh, at the day, back in the days, uh, I mean, I'm pre-TensorFlow. So uh, just, and at the time when I was working, I mean, remember Python 2.7? So that was me at the time. And uh, so, so now, I mean, the technology entry barrier is, re is really low and people, what they need to figure out is uh, how to operationalize machine learning and how to monetize machine learning. So this is really the hardest part. Well, thank you. Um, and so we'll, uh, we'll move on for now. Uh, and uh, uh, for people that maybe arrived a little bit late to the, the webinar, um, if you do have any questions for the panelists, uh, we'll be asking them a little bit closer towards the end, um, but you can use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your Zoom interface in order to be able to do so. 
Uh, but with that, uh, Poe, uh, you're up next. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh, what you're working on? Well, thank you very much. First of all, it's a real pleasure and honor to be able to be here and to talk to all of you and to share this panel with people who are experts in things I don't really know much about. I actually always enjoy this opportunity and it's amazing to be able to have, well, it's a crisis like COVID-19, which brings together all of these different people across public health, across entrepreneurship, across artificial intelligence. And ultimately we need to all solve this together. And that's actually what I'm, what I'm interested in trying to do. Now you may notice from my background that this does not look like a medical laboratory. In fact, this looks more like a streaming setup because I'm actually a streamer. Actually, every single day for an hour, I stream an interactive, completely free YouTube live session where I answer random questions on mathematics from people from all around the world. You see, that's where my starting point is. I'm actually, I'm a social entrepreneur who came in from mathematics and education. In fact, I started xp.com six years ago, which is a, it's, a, it's a relatively small website in the sense that we only have 300,000 people a month coming through, but they come through and they go and they learn mathematics and science for free. I'm a social entrepreneur though, and I said the word free. So in fact, we pay for everything with a line of online math courses, which I created. And what those do is for people who are, for people who are in the top 10% of their algebra class or the top 10% of their geometry class, we help them to go far beyond what the textbook could ever do. In some sense, hopefully they would someday become even uh, innovators like many of the people who are watching or who are on this panel. So I was working on all of these things, mathematics, education. I'm a math professor at Carnegie Mellon University, and I coach this United States International Math Olympiad team. And at the time that COVID-19 struck, we were in some sense fortunate enough to be working in the online education sector, which is a sector that actually has done fairly well during the COVID-19 pandemic. In some sense, if there's a, if there's a lesson for, for people who are doing startups, it's that when there is this black swan event, uh, it is helpful to kind of think about whether or not all the assumptions that you had made before are still relevant. And in particular, when we look at the different things that we were doing as a, as a startup, as, as a company, um, we saw that the online education was actually taking off. So we started to do this and we started to put more and, and indeed people were interested in our classes because when everyone was um, stuck at home, they were interested in maybe seeing what other ways there might be to learn. But there's another important part of the story, you see. I didn't then go and say, then we just hit the gas and we just took over the whole online education market. In, in fact, the story takes a sharp 90 degree turn. And that's because of something in my own history. So when I got my PhD, um, I got a PhD in pure mathematics, which is the opposite, but well, not the opposite. It's not applied mathematics. I was this pure mathematics guy, right? But I got my PhD supported by an organization in the United States called the Hertz Foundation. Hertz is the same Hertz as in the Hertz rental car company. It's the same guy. So the Hertz Foundation is a group which, which, which goes to find 15 people every single year who are about to start their PhD across the United States of America. And they go through a rigorous interview process to find 15 people uh, through, across all the fields of physics, mathematics, engineering, uh, biology, everything. And after these people are interviewed and they're, they're, they're selected, you have the opportunity to do your PhD for free uh, with, with some generous support at many of these uh, good uh, top institutions under the condition that you sign a moral agreement that says that if there's ever a moment of national emergency, you'll lend your skills to help. Actually, the history of the Hertz Foundation is that the founder of it uh, was quite close to a, a scientist named Edward Teller. Edward Teller is the father of the hydrogen bomb. This whole thing was started uh, soon after the Manhattan Project in the United States was involved in bringing together a lot of the top scientists and engineers in an attempt to end World War II. So this, this thing that, that, that I'm, I'm actually one of these guys that got, that got picked a, a long time ago. And the goal of this thing was that if we ever needed another Manhattan project, we would be able to rally together a thousand scientists and engineers. Well, we got activated in the middle of March in the sense that there was a very, there was a very senior member of this community. And this is all voluntary, right? It's a moral commitment. It's not a formal commitment, but there was a very senior, highly respected member of this community who sent a message across to people who had been in this community and starting to raise um, awareness of COVID-19. And it basically spelled out how bad this was from all these different angles, biological and, and also in terms of epidemiology. And it was a call to arms. It basically said, if there was ever a moment of national emergency, it is now. So I got this message. And I got this message in the middle of March. And I remember thinking, I'm a useless pure mathematician. I have my colleagues over here, the, me the mechanical engineers working on better ventilators, low cost ventilators. We got our biology colleagues over there uh, from this same fellowship who are working on vaccines. I'm useless. 
So then, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. A day later, I was reading the dissertation of my PhD student because he, he actually was, was finishing up his, his PhD. And I was reading his, 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 his work. And by the second sentence of the introduction, his work is on network theory. By the second center, sentence of the introduction, it hit me like a flash. COVID-19 is actually a network theory problem. If you actually had anonymous access, uh, access to a completely anonymized network where you don't have a clue of who anyone is or where anyone is, you can still have a massive impact on the spread of this pandemic. It does not need to be a labeled network. It can be an anonymous network and we can use all the tools from network theory to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Unfortunately, I was then not really able to finish helping to review his thesis. Fortunately, he did get his PhD, so nobody was harmed in this process. But as soon as I figured this out, uh, I mean, my background from building XP is I had some background in building apps, uh, designing, pulling together a team. I am an entrepreneur. And so I saw that, uh, and also, I, I mean, my background is pure math, but I also happened to, to do a whole lot of compu computer programming before and software engineering and whatnot. So I, I went through and I thought through what you would need. And in the middle of March, I got the idea of this contact tracing app that would be able to use Bluetooth and ultrasound in order to anonymously find out whether people were next to each other. As soon as I got this idea, I, I basically ran downstairs. I told my family, I was like, hey, you know, would anyone download an app which was completely anonymous and could help you to know whether you might be infecting other people? And I started asking other people. A few hours later, I came to the conclusion that the answer was not only yes, but that this could actually make a huge impact. And then I just immediately, I just I put everything else down. I, I just started reaching out to all the people I knew through my network to try to pull together a crack team to go and build this. And that's actually what we did. I'll, I'll briefly do a screen share. I mean, I don't really, I don't really believe in slides, but I can, I can share one picture, right? So what we ultimately built is we built an app. It's, it's called Novid. Uh, Novid, people have asked us, what does Novid stand for? Uh, it stands for no COVID. That's the answer. But, uh, but, the, the, but the point of this app was, was, can we make a system which would be something that people would feel gives them immediate value? This is the startup mentality, right? The startup mindset is, let's not just make something that people are forced to install. Let's try to make something that an average person would look at and see that they can get an immediate value out of it, and it costs them nothing, nothing to download and nothing in terms of privacy. And if you can deliver something like this with proper user experience design, which is, in my opinion, a key part of having any app, app startup to take off, if you can do both of these, we could actually have a major impact on stopping the spread of COVID-19 and keeping, like, saving thousands of lives, if not millions of lives. The, the screenshots you see here are actually screenshots of a live, well, I mean, they're not screenshots of a live app because that's like a, a, a graphic, but this is a live app. You can download this now. In fact, Novid is the first and currently only anonymous contact tracing app, completely anonymous contact tracing app, that's available, that's been released for download on both Android and iOS in the United States, quite possibly also Canada. There are other apps out there which uh, we do not call anonymous because they either track your, they either ask for your mobile phone information or even worse, they have maybe some, some more sensor data about you, possibly even your entire GPS track. So this is in fact the first thing that, that, that has been released. And just to talk through briefly, you know, what this does, uh, it's quite simple. I mean, afterwards, after we had done this, actually other people have come out with very similar ideas. And, you know, this is quite similar to what, what Apple and Google were trying to do. I'll make a few comments on the technology in a second. But ultimately, it's an app which automatically uses its Bluetooth radio to find out whether near other, other devices are nearby. And then it confirms that they're actually nearby by using ultrasound. Ultrasound has a key advantage that it will not go through walls or ceilings. And so that helps to minimize false positives. Uh, many of these contact tracing apps you've read about on, on the news, all the journalists are saying that there's a major issue of using this Bluetooth signal strength to try to figure out how far away something else is because it can be corrupted by having somebody stand in between or it can actually penetrate through the wall or the ceiling. And at that point, you're registering too many false positives. We actually were the first to go and implement the double, like a one-two punch of the Bluetooth followed by the ultrasound to go and confirm the distance. Now, what this does then after you've, you've anonymously kept track of who else is nearby, uh, if at any point somebody self-reports a positive test, then when they press the report button, uh, this sends anonymous notifications. It's sort of like an anonymous email system. And people who happen to have the app who were nearby during a time that that person was potentially contagious are then alerted that they might actually have, uh, they, might, they, they might be at risk. They might have contracted this virus. An important as aspect of this is we actually are not, we're, we're anonymous. And so when somebody gets that kind of a signal, 
they're not automatically forced to quarantine. In fact, there's no police that's ever gonna find them. We did that on purpose. On the contrary, this is actually an app to help everybody control themselves. Uh, some people are worried that you know, things like this will cause an overreach by governments or by big, big tech technology companies. Well, this is not something to control people. This is something to give every single person situational awareness so that if they happen to see that they might be a potential carrier of COVID-19, then they can be a little bit more careful. For example, if they wanted to go and visit one of their family members or, or another person that they love. I'll tell you that for me, I see that one value of this for me is if I happen to see that I was near somebody who had COVID-19, then I actually would probably not want to visit my mother in person uh, just because she happens to be in a health state for which if she got COVID-19, uh, that would probably be the end. I mean, th this is just something where every single one of us has, has, has people that we care about and what, 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 what I realized is you can just use an anonymous network to provide that situational awareness. And with that, if everybody has that situational awareness, we might be able to go back to using our normal human behavioral norms to help reduce the spread of the virus. What do I mean? So maybe I'll finish with this piece. So one of the most critical things about COVID-19 is that it spreads before you know you have it. That's actually, as a mathematician, what I do is I kind of look at the situation and see what is, what is the unique well, there are many bad things about COVID-19, but what is one terrible point? It is that uh, there has been a paper in Nature Medicine that estimates, scientists estimate, that up to half of your transmission of COVID-19 happens before you even feel the slightest bit sick. This is a very, very distinguishing characteristic. If you look at other diseases like SARS, it, that percent was single digit, if not zero. Uh, for the flu, it's also something like 10% or, or something, something low. But for COVID-19, nearly half. And that's actually what's the what the problem is, because people are now infecting people before they know, and then by the time they know, those people infect people. And so we can't use our normal human behavior. Human behavior is if I sneeze in my hand, I won't shake your hand. But we don't know that. And so we decided to make Novid as a tool to help every single person in the world gain that situational awareness. You've just sneezed into your hand without you knowing it, in the sense that you might be carrying this. Maybe you don't want to go visit that loved one. And if everyone self-modulates this way, the way we normally do as human beings, our hope is that by collaborating, we will be able to have an anonymous solution that doesn't require us to give up any of the, 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 the privacy that we're used to, and where every single one of the seven to eight billion people in the world works together. So that's actually what I'm doing now. In some sense, that seems like quite a pivot from online education, but what I wanted to tell, why I wanted to tell this story is that the DNA is actually the same. It's still building uh, some sort of an app. Uh, what we were doing with education was how to help people make better decisions. That's what education is. And so we're doing that same DNA at its heart for this, uh, this anonymous contact tracing. Well, thank you so much, Pro. Um, so uh, I was going to maybe start with a question with a little bit more about your math background. But unfortunately, I think we're running out of time. So I'll jump into the more uh, 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 maybe serious subject. And it's something that we, I don't know, I was, we were preparing for this yesterday. Uh, you know, around this conversation of anonymity and privacy, um, you know, there's a lot that's being discussed around, especially with the use of uh, contact tracing. Um, but my question is also something that was asked from the audience. Um, so maybe, well, or this theme was also asked by the audience as well. So there was an anonymous attendee. Uh, so maybe, Po, you can start to answer it. And if there's anyone else that'd like to jump in, by all means, go ahead. Um, but this user, essentially what they're asking is, uh, does their ability to track their citizens uh, at the risk of violating their privacy a big factor in reacting to a pandemic? Um, how would you address the issue of privacy and generating new solutions when it comes to monitoring the spread of a virus slash disease? Um, but, you know, what we were talking about yesterday as well is, Sometimes you have to kind of consider how much anonymity is required in order for a contract uh, app to be a contact tracing app to actually be effective. So what are your thoughts on the subject, Pope? So the reason I got excited about this, this as an opportunity to make an impact and, and create a solution is because I come from the network theory background. And from the network theory background, you're used to seeing how powerful algorithms can be if they're network aware. For example, the current algorithm for trying to prevent the spread of COVID-19 is called stay at home. That's, that's one algorithm. Unfortunately, that has a lot of side effects that are quite damaging to everything that we do. And we would all starve if we actually did that. So the problem though, is that if you don't have the network of relationships, it's very hard, for example, to corroborate that this thing here, which was a positive test, was a legit test, 
there, there are of course false positives, or it makes it impossible to use things like surveys. This is a machine learning and artificial intelligence community here. Of course, surveys and, and, and would, be, would be wonderful if you could have this relationship data as well. So my, my insight was actually, a lot of things we've been hearing about are even more privacy invasive in the sense that you would actually want to know exactly who is this, exactly where did they go to eat. You go to the, this is, this is traditional contact tracing. You go to the restaurant, you find the receipts, you see who else was at that restaurant. I'm not criticizing that. I, I'm saying that that's actually what those countries which have been successful have been doing. Um, I'm not here to go and argue whether they should, we should do that or we shouldn't do that because that's not what, what I work on. On the other hand, I do know it works. Now, what, what we decided that we could do is we could provide an alternative tool, which is completely anonymous. So in some sense, it's not, it's not alternative in the sense of replacing. You, I think of them as complementing each other, reducing the amount of work that the shoe leather, uh, the, the, the ones who actually walk around uh, doing contact tracing, reducing, reducing their amount of work and letting everyone else get involved. But the important thing here about the trade-off, which I think is worth saying, is that you know, in, in, the, in the public conversations about what kind of protocols or what kind of methods should we be using for contact tracing, my starting point for this was not that I wanted to make a contact tracing app for the sake of making a contact tracing app. My point from starting this was, oh, I've been activated to try to solve this problem. It's from a systems level approach. And then at that point, it, my, my key observation was, there's a huge value in an anonymous network as long as the network is actually unlabeled with no GPS information and no personal identifiable information. If all you have is there's user number 5,206 who at 12.51 PM on Wednesday, May 20th was with user 2,307. Yes, in theory, you could go and take this big network and try to guess what cities people live in based on big cluster sizes. But judging from the way people travel within the city, it's still gonna be very hard to tie down exactly who this is. Is it, is it possible? In theory, it might be possible. But in my opinion, this sort of thing, when we're, th when we're thinking about the trade-off between efficacy and anonymity, it seems like this point of the trade-off might be one where you're then able to do something like this. You, in, this in this anonymous network, you see a flash of infections coming around here. You really would like to alert all the people out here that in about one week, there's going to be something which is sweeping over to where they are. Is it important to tell them whether, is it important to know whether they live in Somerville or Pittsburgh or Montreal or Manila? That's actually not the most important piece. Uh, if, if we're trying to make something anonymous, we could actually just alert them that according to the graph theory, this is happening. So that's why what we are trying right. to do is we're really trying to say, when we're discussing this, let's not just make anonymous contact tracing apps for the sake of making the anonymous contact tracing apps. Let's think of the big problem and once we think of the big problem, we might find out that the place to draw the spectrum is a certain point. So, JF, uh, I think you have a, a point. Well, well two, two quick items. So, uh, so I mean, and it's, it's actually a, what Pojan said is it's actually true also in, in marketing and in most machine learning algorithm uh, application. And so it's, it's not about people. We don't actually care who you are personally. We just want to know, and this is what people using these kind of app really need to understand is we just want to know what, uh, what tribe are you part of? So you personally, we don't care who you are. And so in advertising, it's, we want to know what user segment you are so we can send you the, like, the right uh, publicity. And for an application, it's, 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 they, only, they have their own uh, their specificity, but the bottom line is this. And also, and just a shameless plug here, so uh, the, the Mila the, this weekend released a, a similar app. So uh, in Canada, well, they announced it, so I didn't follow up uh, if, if it was released on the Android store or uh, on the uh, Apple, uh, Apple store. And they also released a white paper on how they develop their app and all the user privacy. So maybe if people are interested, they could uh, take a look at that also. Can I just, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to jump in from a public health perspective. So, um, yeah, I agree with everything both of you guys said about this and Poe, especially when you kind of mentioned that contact tracing is a tool, uh, not a solution to the whole problem. So um, in public health, obviously, we've been doing, um, you know, HIV partner notification for years. And while that, you know, can tell the one person that they've come into contact with HIV, it doesn't end the stigma, you know, it doesn't ensure that they have access to healthcare. So it's part of a larger, um, you know, public health uh, problem. And, and same here with COVID-19, contact tracing is just one of the pieces. 
um, of the puzzle. And here in the US, especially, I see a lot of people getting worked up about um, contact tracing as you know an infringement on their personal rights. But again, I would say that we've been doing it for years with HIV um, and you know sexual partner notification. And you know, I would argue that that's a more private thing than who you walked past um, on the street. Um, and you know, that wasn't done with apps. That's done with um, people with you know records in in an office building where they can just like look at your address and you know what I mean. I feel like there's there's just less privacy involved in the old school way than you know what um, Poe has developed and what the Mila has developed as well. So uh, before we go too far down this rabbit hole of privacy, because uh, there's definitely quite a lot of subjects, especially around this uh, topic of contact tracing, uh, bring it a little bit more into the startup side. Um, so I do have a question from an audience uh, from someone by the name of uh, Asfar uh, Adib. Um, so while uh, attempting COVID-19 related research, an obvious challenge uh, from an academic side, but also from a startup side as well, I'm sure, uh, is that they're facing a lack of medical data of patients. Um, so since the disease is new and hospitals are still trying to focus on the treatment side, you know, getting access to that data can be quite difficult. Um, and each person here maybe has their different perspective on it. So any suggestions about how to uh, get this type of data or how to work with hospitals in order to be able to uh, facilitate the development of solutions? Well, one thing that is great about COVID-19 for all the AI uh, ecosystem is it's going to speed up like all these uh, everything surrounding like digitalization uh, so having data so defining all the governance policies around how to handle data uh, all the privacy policies uh, how to distribute data and what to gather or not so it's going to speed it so what was only pain points before now it, it, it's a matter of surviving for for a lot of, of, of players so uh, we're talking hospitals and and also companies and so uh, so all these so people are working very hard now are defining these kind of policies so uh, you're gonna see things open up maybe let's cross our finger and so getting data is is one thing but uh, another hot topic in uh, especially in the healthcare it's how to generate data so uh, there were a lot of research uh, done on that in the past and so we saw a few companies here and there and that were uh, i forgot the name but one company who uh, the goal is to generate data uh, as as a tool for privacy so the data the data generated so it's not uh, it doesn't belong to anybody so it's it doesn't have a user id so uh, then it's it's kind of anonymizing the data by generating like new data looks like the the initial batch so the, you have these kinds of, of processes and, and research project that are uh, ongoing and they are becoming applications. Oh, maybe I just want to add something here. Um, so, so I think that actually there's a, there's a huge need for this kind of innovation that the startup community is representing. So in some sense, it's, it's, a, it's a legit question. It's a bit too bad that it's difficult to get access to this, but we actually do need to have great ideas from machine learning and innovation to help us crack this problem. Something that could be helpful, at least what has been useful for us, is that Novid didn't just develop in isolation. We are actually associated, we, we also had the chance to work with Carnegie Mellon University. And I assume that in, in these uh, other incubation centers that you have here, you might have some universities which have some kind of, uh, some kind of affiliation or some kind of a connection. It doesn't have to be a university. It could also be a, a, a research center. I, I think Mila, is, is, that, is, that, is that how I pronounce it? Mila is another research center, right? Hello, yeah. so, so my point is actually, if you just have an idea on your own, it might even be valuable to try to connect in with one of these, one of these centers because again, I'll speak from a, being a professor. There are lots of great ideas that come in, in academia, but if there's not a person who understands product or if there's not a person who understands how to execute this out, that idea is never going to leave academia. And in some sense, the reason why Novid went out is because I'd already been running a startup for six years. And so when the idea came, but we plugged in with the Carnegie Mellon expertise and then we also ran out the door. And what I'm saying is that in this call, why I think it's so interesting to have so many of these people in this call is that the many different pieces of this equation are present. And if there's some way where you have this idea and you can work maybe through, through the incubators or through, or through Mila to come in through, then you might be able to actually help save the world. I think it's very important. Patricia, any thoughts? Yeah, I was just suggest uh, connecting with like a university. Um, I know epidemiologists and public health specialists have access to a lot of this data. So if there's a school of public health um, that you could work with or an epidemiology 
um, research institute that you could work with, I would suggest reaching out to them because they are always have access to um, whatever hospital they're affiliated with and their data. Oh, so uh, we're running out of time here. So maybe I'll ask one uh, last question for the group. Um, so what should I pick here? Uh, so um, maybe we'll, well, since, you know, each person here represents a different ecosystem, uh, you know, with JF in Montreal, with Poe in Pittsburgh, and with Patricia in Boston, um, you know, each has gotten that opportunity to experience, you know, the ecosystem over there, especially the entrepreneurship ecosystem. Um, so what are your thoughts in the current entrepreneurship scene in each one of your respective areas in terms of how they're responding to COVID-19? And where do you think that there's areas maybe for improvement or areas for collaboration? Maybe I can start from Montreal. So uh, the, the, the Montreal ecosystem is, uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem is quite young. So it's, it's very dynamic. Some people would say two dynamics. Uh, so, uh, so things, so just being able to organize ourselves. So, and this is what is happening right now. So COVID was actually like a, a, an excuse kind of to, to do that. So you have everybody from the ecosystem who are talking to each other and now it's uh, once each two weeks. And so we, we really get, have a feeling of, okay, we are really in this together. And so, and for, for Montreal specifically, what is, is lacking is still well funding. So early stage uh, private funding. So this is really, I mean, it's a pain point that people have been knowing for years, uh, but that is still going. That being said, I mean, all the, uh, uh, all the finances are organizations. So, uh, sorry, it's like my French uh, is, is, is getting the better of me. And uh, so they, maybe they are slowed down like Arch Quebec, but uh, not, Arch Quebec is not slowed down at all. So they, they, they want startups to, to, to pitch at, at them. So they are either, slow down or still ongoing business as usual. So uh, things are not stopped uh, at that level, but they're still, we're still lacking in Montreal uh, and in Quebec in general around that. Oh, Patricia? Okay, I guess I'll answer since you mentioned my name first. Um, I, I'd say that the Pittsburgh ecosystem is one where people tend to be able to know what other people are doing in the sense that it's a small enough place that, uh, that there are newsletters that go around also, I'd say that the Pittsburgh ecosystem has a lot of tech influence, right? In the sense that there are universities, both uh, are, which are making like Carnegie Mellon University doing its work often in computer science, robotics, and so on. But we also have the University of Pittsburgh, which is working, which has a lot of expertise in the medical fields. So what I'd say is that I think that right now everything is regrouping. We are actually a little bit lucky in Pittsburgh that somehow the, the COVID-19 virus has not gone as far in devastating our region. So I'm, a little, I'm actually a little bit optimistic that we will be able to pull things, uh, pull things together. But I would expect that a lot of the innovations that will come out of Pittsburgh will focus on using the new technology that's been created by the various uh, sources, the universities, the hospitals, to go and uh, to advance forward. Because otherwise, it's very hard to make a ride-sharing startup right now. I mean, it's just like all of the old, old ideas that you might do are, are in a different environment. Last words to you, Patricia. Yeah, so... Like I said earlier, even though there are, um, you know, some layoffs um, for some companies that were unable to pivot um, to tackling this crisis, I know that just due to the um, life sciences industry that is so prevalent here, a lot of uh, smaller startups that may have been focusing on a different infectious disease um, have now just been able to fully focus on COVID-19 and therefore been able to kind of weather the storm. Um, for now. So, you know, I'm very hopeful that the Boston ecosystem will be particular, particularly resilient just due to the fact um, uh, that we're a life sciences hub and, um, you know, the proximity to great universities, great research, uh, key opinion leaders, that kind of thing. And uh, just uh, before we wrap up here, because uh, there's still a few questions in chat that we're not, uh, unfortunately, going to have time to get to. Um, if people want to reach out to you, what's the best way to do it? Uh, po, maybe starting with you. Great. Yes, uh, there's an email we have. Hello at novid.org. We'd be very happy to hear from you. And we're really happy looking forward for ways. Uh, we're looking for ways to collaborate. Thank you. Yeah. For me, it's like LinkedIn for Ivado. It's we have a web page, contact information. You fill out a form, and somebody will answer you shortly. Patricia, and I'm on LinkedIn, but I don't check that as much. Um, and I tweet frequently about COVID nineteen and um, AI and public health. So I'm on Twitter at, at Patricia Gruber. Very easy. 
Well, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for joining us today. Uh, it was a really insightful conversation uh, coming from across different communities and uh, different backgrounds. Uh, so with that, uh, we will be concluding our webinar. Uh, if you are interested in uh, learning about uh, some of the stuff that we're doing at District 3, you can always go to d3center.ca. Uh, we also are doing webinars uh, or you know, these types of events pretty consistently. Uh, so you always can go to our social media to check it out. Uh, and if you do want to sign up uh, to our newsletter, you could do so through uh, d3center.ca. Uh, but with that, thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll see you at the next event.